welcome back to my channel! Yes, I'm actually here filming a video for you and my PhD is not submitted, no, but as you can tell from the title of this video, I am here to talk about my favourite books I've read so far in 2022 and I did not want to miss the opportunity to film this video because it's something I've filmed every year for years now. I love talking about the books that I have enjoyed the most both at the end of the year and in the middle because I think you have a slightly different perspective halfway through the year you know you've read less and um, you can reflect more recently and it means that if my overall you know top 10 maybe changes by the end of the year I've still had a chance to shout out how great these books are because they are all fantastic and I would highly recommend each and every one of them so on that note I can confirm there are 10 books in this video. We have everything from non-fiction to romance, from fantasy to comic books and a few other genres smattered in there as well. I haven't really read as much this year as I have done in previous years but as I've talked about in my past couple of videos I am in a very transitional period of my life and I am very high on the stress scale. <laughs> I have been finishing up my PhD, it's due on the 31st of July, so less than a month now, and because of that I have naturally read less, which is absolutely fine, but there's still been some great books in that selection. So yeah, stay tuned if you want to hear about some of the best books I've read so far in 2022. Before I start on the books however, I do want to say a massive thank you to the sponsor of today's video, who are very aptly Another one of my favourite things of the year, they're just not books, and that is Ana Luisa. So as you may have seen, I have partnered with Ana Luisa in the past, over the past few years, and they have very, very firmly become my go-to jewellery brand throughout that whole experience. I'm wearing all Ana Luisa today, from my fingers to my neck to my ears, and that's pretty much me every day these days. Ana Luisa is my go-to and there are a few reasons for that. They make incredible quality pieces which are at a price point which is much more affordable than a lot of higher end jewellery that is made to last and that's the thing when I pick up a piece of jewellery now I want something that's going to last. I want a selection of different things but I also want things that I'm still going to be wearing in decades to come. But even more importantly than all of that is the fact that um, Ana Luisa do prioritise sustainability in their production. They are both carbon and water neutral from production to shipping which is incredibly important and they also primarily use recycled gold to prevent further gold mining which can damage our planet and our environment and when there is already so many materials out there why wouldn't you want to recycle them? And it means I can feel incredibly proud to wear their jewellery. As I've already mentioned, I am, you know, fingers to ears in pieces right now. I have on this gorgeous chunky ring. I don't have a lot of more statement rings. and I really like this because although it's a statement piece with like the big black stone, it also feels quite neutral because of the colours and it will go with a lot of things. I also have on a chunkier necklace today, which I'm in love with. I think this is my new favourite favourite necklace ever since it arrived in the post. I literally put it on the same day. It is absolutely stunning. And then I have both a set of their bamboo hoops and their huggies in. Ana Luisa huggies have actually saved my ears. They're pretty much the only earrings I've been able to leave in overnight and for long periods of time in the second piercing on my earlobe so that's been fantastic and whilst I was at it I did decide to pick up and whilst I was at it I also decided to pick up their bamboo hoops because these are just a classic design. I remember them being super duper popular when I was a teenager and I've always wanted a pair. I'm a big fan of the gold hoop, I've said it before but if I can get like a slightly jazzier, a slightly different gold hoop then all the better which which these absolutely fulfill. So yeah, that's a little bit about Ana Luisa. Thank you once again to them for supporting my channel, for sponsoring this video. If you'd like to grab yourself some pieces, then make sure to check them out via the link in the description box down below. And if you do, make sure to use the code GENEBOOKS10 for an additional 10% off. And without further ado, let's talk about my favourite books I've read so far in 2022. Right, so in no particular order, the first book on my list or on my computer screen is Love That Journey For Me, The Queer Revolution of Shit's Creek by Emily Garside. So this is a pretty small non-fiction book published by 404 Inc in their Inklings series. So they have this series of like short non-fiction books, a lot of which are sort of like 
critiques. Critique always sounds to me like a negative word, but you know, like commentaries on popular culture, music, film, TV, fashion, and a few other bits and pieces. I haven't actually read any more in the series, but I'm interested to check them out. This one, however, I had to pick up as soon as I saw it because I am a die-hard fan of Schitt's Creek and all I can say is the girls that get it, get it. <laughs> like, if you don't love Schitt's Creek, I am sorry, like, that sucks for you because it's maybe like the best thing to have been created for television ever. <laughs> um, and there's a ton of reasons for that, but particularly because of the queer representation and what it has done, I think, for the queer community on television and on mainstream media, which is what this book is about. It is about the queer revolution of Schitt's Creek. So Schitt's Creek is a TV show that's created by Daniel Levy and Eugene Levy, who are father and son. You may recognise Eugene Levy from the um, very popular franchise American Pie, which I confess I was obsessed with as a teenager. They are the co-creators behind this series um, and you can see the love that is poured into this series, particularly, I think, by Daniel Levy um, in terms of the representation. The character that he specifically plays in the show is Pan um, and you see him have relationships with both men and women but that's not the only representation. There is other like central queer characters and then there is also just um, a safety in the show. There is this environment throughout the show um, of safety I think that um, a lot of queer people have never fully experienced in real life. It's it's about a family of um, a brother, a sister, a mother and a father who are incredibly wealthy but it turns out their financial advisor or whatever has scammed them out of all their money and they basically have nothing left to their name except for this random tiny little town um, called Shits Creek that the dad bought his son as a joke years ago and with nowhere else to go they end up living in this tiny little town and they have to readjust completely um, to society and one of the things that Schitt's Creek offers is this safety. There is really like absolutely no homophobia in the show and um, I think and one of the thing and one of the things that Emily Garside talked about in her book is that um, this inherent safety for queer people that exist in Schitt's Creek then extends to everybody. It becomes a place of acceptance um, underlined by the fact that it accepts anyone regardless of their sexuality and gender identity but it then accepts everyone for everything else as well and it's a really beautiful like I said safe space I think everyone feels safe in not just the queer characters and it's kind of hard for me to talk too much about the contents of this book other than what I've already said unless you've watch the show because obviously it's commenting on the show and it does have spoilers for the show inside it. Um, but if you are a Shits Creek fan, which I know some of you are, I've talked about it with you in the past, this is such a lovely little companion book, particularly I think if you're a queer person who loves Shits Creek, it is well worth checking out. And if you haven't gotten into Shits Creek yet or if you've only watched the first couple of episodes and not been sure, then stick at it, give it another shot because I find it did take me maybe one or two episodes to get into it. And since then I have watched it three times all the way through and recommended it to everybody I know and obviously carried on by reading complimentary material which I loved. Really really enjoyed Emily Garside's commentary on the show and it really made me want to pick up more books that provide critique and commentary on some of my favourite shows and movies. So I'm definitely going to be looking out for that and in particular if you know of any that um, discuss like LGBTQ plus representation in film and TV then I'd love to hear about them. Which Brings me quite aptly, I think, onto the next book I want to mention in this video, which is Girls Can Kiss Now by Jill Gutowitz. So Jill Gutowitz is a journalist or a cultural commentator who um, writes articles about, again, music, film, TV, um, pop culture, what have you. And this is her debut essay collection, which brings together a lot of those themes, but from quite a personal perspective, as well as um, through the lens of her journey um, as a lesbian and coming out as a queer woman and her life experiences, whether they be her experiences growing up in the um, 90s and early 2000s or whether they be her um, working in like Hollywood and the film and TV industry or whether they be about her relationships um, dating other women and it is such a like personal, funny, 
interesting essay collection and I could really relate to Yoga Oats in a lot of ways and I think particularly because we were born so close together. She I think mentioned being born in 1991 and I was born in 1992 so as queer women, although we grew up across the ponds from each other, we consumed a lot of the same media growing up. So it was really fun to hear her take on that media and it gave me a lot of flashbacks to um, a lot of the homophobia inherent in the media I was consuming when I was um, growing up in the 90s and in the early 2000s and how that um, like transferred into my reality and how it was subsumed by myself and my friends and did not create a safe space um, as a young queer woman trying to like find her footing and come out. So that was really, really relatable. In other respects, our lives are very, very different, but I really enjoyed hearing about her life. I think she has a really funny, personable narrative voice and um, it reminded me how much I do like reading essay collections, particularly those that um, kind of track the like history of the person narrating the story through popular culture and um, kind of film and cinema and TV and I'm just repeating myself now but you, you know what I mean, it's been a while since I've read a collection like that and I think both of those two books really reminded me how interesting they can be and how much I'd like to check out more of them. While we're here I actually just think I should rattle through the rest of the non-fiction that's on this list because there are two more. Um, and the first one is In Black and White by Alexandra Wilson. So this again is sort of part memoir, it's very much the story of um, the author Alexandra Wilson um, and her experiences but specifically her experiences of becoming a barrister as a young black British woman in the UK and it's also an examination of the legal system and um, what we do and don't know as ordinary people living in the UK. I was really shocked um, by the amount of things she talked about in that book and the amount of experiences she had in that book of people basically being indicted for crimes that they didn't even know were crimes and I say shocked only because of like how easy it felt like wow that could happen to me that could happen to anybody because we're really not taught fully about the law. I know murder is illegal obviously but I think there are lots of small details about um, the laws of our own countries that probably a lot of us don't realise um, how seriously that they can be treated. Um, but it also talks about the inequality but it also talks about a lot of both the problems in terms of inequality and disparity in the people being convicted of crimes and also the people representing them in court. Alexandra Wilson was 25 when she wrote this book, um, newly qualified as a barrister in the UK and like one of the only black women in her field in the UK. There is already an underrepresentation of women in that field, there's an underrepresentation of people of colour in that field, let alone to be a black woman in that field. Um, by the sounds of it, she was one of the only um, black female barrister that at least a lot of her clients had ever met. And she was talking about how important it is to have representation within the representatives, if that makes sense. And I thought it was really interesting to just get the genuine perspective of somebody within the legal system who had dealt with like racism and sexism in her own life and in her work um, about what it was like to be in her field and what changes she felt were important within her field. Like I didn't agree with her on everything. I think um, perhaps I have slightly less faith in the um, like legal and policing systems in the UK than Alexandra Wilson does inherently but I guess that also makes sense, she works in that field. Um, but I did find it really really interesting, I'm really educational as somebody that lives in the UK um, and I really felt like I learned a lot from it. It was also very accessibly written, I don't think you need to have any like legal knowledge or background to understand or follow it and I think a lot of people could benefit from reading it. Then lastly for non-fiction is actually a magazine issue. So I wanted to briefly mention the most recent issue of Hellebore magazine that I read because it came out this year and I read it immediately when it arrived at my house. I pre-ordered it. It's the first time I think since I was a teenager that I pre-ordered a magazine and that was issue 7, The Ritual Issues. I first discovered this magazine last year I think it was and firmly fell in love with it from the first issue I read. It's specific focus is on the history of folklore and horror 
um, and it's really really enjoyable from a lot of different perspectives for me it's really enjoyable to the historian side of myself I really really enjoy that aspect of it in particular it focuses on folk horror in Britain and the history of that and um, whether it be through art whether it be through literature whether it be through practice or um, history itself like the history of history or historiography but I also find it interesting as somebody who is interested in folklore and the esoteric and it brings a lot of those things together. I've learned really fun and interesting stuff from every single issue. It's been fascinating and I never know what I'm going to get. There's been really interesting contributors, a lot of whom I've gone on to like follow on Twitter, Instagram so I can keep up with their work which has been great. I've also started making a note of interesting sites in the UK that I'd like to visit that I've learned about um, from these different issues and also books I might like to pick up or films I might like to watch in the future. But what I particularly liked about this most recent issue, the um, ritual issue, was that it also as a magazine does not, you know, shy away from um, the more problematic sides of certain practices um, in the history of folk horror or in folklore or like local traditions and cultures and it does touch upon um, some of the issues of racism in, for example, Morris dancing and I really really appreciated that. It's not a magazine that romanticises all of these practices, it is very well researched, interesting pieces on different aspects of folk horror and British history and it does touch on the problematic stuff as well as the more pleasant and interesting stuff so I really really appreciate that about this issue in particular. Moving away from non-fiction to fiction, let's actually start with the comic book on this list because there's a bit of a tangent in that it also deals with the sort of esoteric and pagan which is black magic volume one. So this is written by Greg Rucker and illustrated by Nicholas Scott and I would say it's a combination of the crime mystery genre and the horror genre. We follow a US police detective who is also a witch and one of the things I've really enjoyed about this series so far is that she's not just somebody with a magical power, she is also like a religious witch, she's a practicing pagan and she's part of a coven and I really enjoyed that because I, I love when um, books that have magic in them actually like draw from like pagan practices and folklore etc so that was a really nice touch and I think it adds to the world building and I also thought the storyline and artwork were really really good. It really does read like a passion project for those involved in it. It feels like a lot of love has been poured into both like I said the writing and the illustrations and it, it drew me I thought the plot was really really interesting there's like a murder mystery side to things which clearly have like a magical subplot there's like dark magic at play there we have our police detective in danger we have her trying to hide secrets from her fellow detectives and I was immediately drawn in. Like I am so excited to read the rest of the issues in this series to see where it goes in the future and honestly I think it would make a fantastic TV show like adapt it for the television. I'd be here for that. So yeah, it was really nice to discover a new comic book series. Right, now it's time to talk novels. The first book I have in front of me to talk about is A Master of Gin by P. Jelly Clark. So this is actually the first novel in a series but the fourth book? So there are three novellas slash short stories that chronologically come before. Um, a Master of Gin, the first one of which I believe was a dead gin in Cairo. I'm just going to double check that. <laughs> um, yeah, so the first short story or novella was a dead gin in Cairo. Then there was a second novella called The Angel of Khan El Khalili. And then there was a third, which was The Haunting of Tram Car 015. Now, I didn't actually realise there'd been three novellas before this novel, so I'd only read two of them. I'd read the first one and the third one. I hadn't read the Angel book um, which I didn't even realise existed until there was some sort of like nods to it in the novel but I didn't really feel like I missed a lot by not reading it. Um, I think the novel clarified everything I could have needed to know so I think in that respect you could probably just jump into this novel not having read any of the novellas or short stories but from my personal experience and just based on my personal opinion, I think maybe I would recommend just reading at least the first one. So 
read a dead gin in Cairo if you can. But I do think it's written in a way that technically you can read it. I just think in terms of the central relationship, so between our protagonist, Fatima, who is a detective and um, her love interest and other women in this world, um, you see the beginnings of that relationship in the, the short story and I personally feel like it was really nice to have witness that build up to their relationship beforehand. So, okay, I think I've like clarified um, how the structure of the series works. Now let's talk about um, the plot and the world. So this is an alternative history novel which P. Jelly Clark seems to specialise in. I've read quite a few of his like alternative history novels and loved them. This one is set in an alternative um, history timeline based in Cairo in the early 1900s. And the massive difference here, aside from like political details etc, is that there are jinn and other magical creatures in this world. They have been recognised, they have been found and identified and are now a part of society. And in particular Cairo in Egypt was a massive um, origin place for these magical creatures, for jinn in particular, which has helped them become um, a very large world power which has also, you know, like changed the political dynamics of the world overall and there's different magical creatures in different countries and it was nice getting more tidbits about actually some of the other magic in the world in this book and we follow Fatima who already mentioned is a detective, she is one of the few female detectives in what is effectively like a police force for the supernatural, they specifically investigate crimes or incidents involving the supernatural and jinn and other magical entities. She's actually a human but she's with this agency and this is like the first full-length novel, so like the first full-length mystery in this world and it was so much fun. Like I loved Fatima's character when I met her in um, A Dead Jinn in Cairo so I was so excited that there was going to be this whole novel about her and it did not disappoint. It really, you know, like elevated those seeds I feel like P. Jelly Clark planted in the novellas and created this really fantastic, intriguing world and mystery. And the initial premise is that this cult, effectively, this predominantly, like, this group of predominantly, like, white English men who have come over I'm um, from England who are very wealthy, who, you know, sort of like benefit from business in Cairo, in Cairo politics, um, that are members of this cult are all murdered. <laughs> They're murdered under supernatural circumstances at the very offset of the novel and Fatima gets drawn in um, to investigate the case. I'll say no more because obviously there is a mystery there, I don't want to um, spoil all the twists and turns, but like I said, I loved what P. Jelly Clark did with this novel. It really, really built on those like, like, building blocks that he previously established and created something so intriguing. I'm so excited for future novels in this series and not least because I love the character Fatima and her love interest whose name is Siti and Siti is also a worshipper of Sekhmet who is an ancient Egyptian goddess and I also really enjoy not only like the political backdrop of these books but the sort of religious backdrop. We have a predominantly Muslim society but there are still those that worship the ancient Egyptian gods um, and the sort of like balance between those two religions and cultures in one place is really fun to read about so yeah really really like these books did not disappoint, in fact, like exceeded all expectations, cannot wait for more. Another fantasy novel I absolutely fell head over heels in love with and is probably no surprise to anybody was Flame of Seven Waters by Julian Rillier. So this is the sixth and final book in the Seven Waters series and I am not going to dwell on this book for long because if you've been watching my videos for any length of time you'll know how big a fan I am of Juliet Merlier but basically this is my favourite series she's written, it's a six book series and um, the first book in the series is one of my favourite books of all time called Daughter of the Forest and they're all set in medieval Ireland predominantly following mortal women who are members of this family, the Seven Waters family but who have encounters with the Fae and I've been putting off reading books six for you know over a year to be honest. I was so nervous about finishing the series I think because I love it so much and I didn't want to disappoint and also because book five was not my favourite. Like I still enjoyed it but it was more of like a three and a half than a five star which all the other books in the series have been. So yeah I was nervous 
But thankfully it finished on a bang, loved this book, loved our protagonist Maeve and I'm not going to say anything more than that because it's book six, I don't want to spoil anything. However, if you like historical fiction, if you like fantasy, this is such a beautiful combination of those genres. There is some really beautiful slow burn um, like romantic subplots in all of the books but it's not like the... Um, primary focus, they're much more the stories of young strong women, all very unique individual who have their own strengths, weaknesses and accomplish great things and I love them. Right, we have one more book with a fantastical paranormal factor before we move on to those entirely rooted in reality but no less, you know, magical in their own way and that is Needed in Gary Reeve by L. M. Drew. So this is a paranormal romance novel. It is very spicy so if you're not here for the spicy romances then this is not one for you but if you are this book is fantastic. It is the second book in the Gary Reeve series which is a series of shifter romances. We have a town that basically traps people it thinks might benefit the rest of the people living there. It's like not entirely sinister I would say. It sort of sees a need in people who are driving past and helps them find this town but then also doesn't let them leave. Um, it very much decides what is best for them so there, there's problems in that and it can be a little bit stressful for sure but unequivocally every single time our protagonist falls in love with one of our wolf shifters. It is good fun romance. Every single one has been a complete page turner like I've read it in a day or two and that is all three books but I have to say book two so far has been my favourite so that's why it's the one that's on this list. In this book we follow Scarlett who's a nurse practitioner and she decides it's time for change. She's spent her years so far working in a really busy, busy hospital in a city and she wants to settle down somewhere smaller, somewhere more local and um, to be a healthcare provider for like a small community and she discovers there is a job opening in Gary Reeve. However, when she gets there, there was nobody who actually hired her. There's nobody to actually account for the job she was given or whoever she communicated with. She has just turned up here with no one to expect her except the town, which clearly wants her to work there um, for whatever reason. But along with the town, there is also a rather interesting young man. Yes. <laughs> and they spark a romance. I won't say anything else about the plot because um, I don't want to spoil anything and it's great fun like you know obviously going along on that journey with them but I loved their romance, I loved their relationship, I really enjoyed the twists and the turns it took. I found it very compelling the way it unfolded and I also love Scarlett. She is a fantastic heroine. And from a more personal perspective, um, I really enjoyed the um, representation that Scarlett provided um, for somebody who had a lot of scarring. Um, I have a lot of scarring, not because of the same reasons as um, Scarlett, but it's something that she's self-conscious about in the book. It's something that's touched on when it comes to the intimate scenes in the book. And I really appreciate that because it's definitely something that I don't see represented a lot in books, particularly romance books and as somebody who does feel self-conscious um, quite often about her skin and her scarring it meant a lot to me. So extra thanks to Elle for including that but yeah this is just a great fun series would recommend. On the topic of romance novels I do have a historical romance novel on my list of favourites so far and that is My Dangerous Duke by Galen Foley. So this is my first romance novel by Galen Foley and I'm definitely going to be checking out more. I'm pretty sure I immediately bought another book by her on my Kindle although I haven't read it yet. Um, however there was a reason I particularly loved this not just because it was well written because you know you kind of expect every book in this video to be well written and interesting but because it was a real fun combination of genres it was both like a historical romance set in the 1800s but it was also a swashbuckling adventure and I have to say I've not read a lot of swashbuckling adventures in my life but you know this was one and it was great fun. There were pirates, there were hidden treasures, there um, were like secret coded languages and things to uncover, there was feisty young women, there was sexy brooding dukes and it all came together in a really superb way. It also felt like there was a lot in there, like it felt like quite a meaty novel that had a lot to offer and it didn't rush through the 
the storytelling or the narrative. It was really nicely paced and I felt like it gave space and time to all of the elements um, without feeling slow either. So yeah, I was really impressed um, by the writing, um, by the storyline, by the characters, by the romance and everything else really. It introduced me to a new romance author I'm definitely going to be checking out more of in the future, which was great because I, I picked this one up on a whim to be honest. It was on the shelves of Waterstones on Piccadilly Circus, which is the only bookshop pretty much I've ever gone in that has a really big romance selection so I wanted to pick some up and this was one that I pulled off the shelf and thought it sounded interesting so it's nice when you pick up a book really randomly like that and it ends up really jiving with you and you want to read more by that author. So yeah if you're looking for a historical romance um, with a bit more of um, a plot that involves a mystery and something aside from the romance, which you don't have to. Romance is perfectly adequate as a plot in itself, but if you want it to have a little bit more, then this is maybe a great one to go for. Then last but not least is another author I discovered this year, but you know, definitely I'm not the first to discover because this is quite a prolific author, and that is Shelter in Place by Nora Roberts. And this one had to go on the list in particular because it's by an author I've meant to read for a long, long time. I've heard a lot about Nora Roberts, you know, she's had her books adapted into film. I think she's written like over a hundred novels at this point. She has books under pseudonyms, she writes books in the fantasy, the sci-fi, the romance, the thriller genres, and I've just, like I said, been hearing a lot about her for a long, long, long time. And wanted to read her, didn't know how I was going to react, and then from like chapter one of this book, I got it. I just got it. I was like, okay, I see why she has such a big fan base. I see why her books are so well received and she keeps writing them and they keep being purchased and read by so many because she has a real way with words and I think she has a real way with storytelling and characters um, that unfolds in a truly page turning way. I mean, I use the term page turning a lot, but in this sense, this was like a real like true example of a page turner. Not that it was like super fast paced, it was actually a lot more of a slow paced book than I was expecting it to be. But you are just like drawn in, you're absorbed by the characters and the scenarios that they are in from the beginning and the way it's written is like very emotive and you get quite attached to them all. From what I was expecting, I thought this was going to be like a romance with a thriller subplot from the get-go, from like chapter one, chapter two, but it's actually much more of like a slow unfolding of the lives of particularly two characters who were involved in a trauma and a tragedy in their teenage years. They um, survived a mass shooting at a mall in America and it's about them living their lives, about them dealing with that trauma, about um, their dreams and their friendships and their relationships and um, careers and decisions they make about that. And you follow them over quite a few years before they ever meet. You know from the blurb that there's going to be a romance eventually. Um, but that takes a while to get to it, but it didn't bother me at all. I did not care how long it took to get there because I was just so enjoying following along with these characters um, and learning about them. They felt very real and I really, really appreciated that. I really enjoyed how real they felt, how um, like depthy they felt, <laughs> how complex they felt, um, and how much I became invested in their stories and um, watching them unfold. Then there was, of course, a mystery. Somebody um, has started killing off the survivors of this mass shooting and that's going on in the background over the years and it takes a while for the police to piece it together and you follow that. You know who is committing the murders from very early on in the book because you also get their perspective um, but it's still very compelling as like a thriller plotline even though you know that so that was really well done and I thought it was like a very emotive really compelling story so yeah I'm definitely going to be checking out Mordor Roberts. I say that, I've already read two more um, but I'm going to keep checking her out. Um, I get it, I've joined the fan club so those are my favourite books I've read so far of the year. It actually accounts for a third of the books I've read this year. Yeah I hope you enjoyed um, hearing about these 
books. I hope you got some more recommendations. I'd love to hear from you about the best books you've read so far this year and you will see me back on um, your YouTube <laughs> subscription feed soon. D I'm definitely going to be picking up with more consistent video making um, come August, September once my PhD's handed in. I can't wait. I've got some really fun and exciting plans and um, I really appreciate you sticking around waiting for them and checking out the videos I am able to upload. So yeah, thank you so much um, and thank you again to Anna Luisa for sponsoring this video. It's a huge support that gives me um, the time and space to create content which is fantastic. They will of course be linked down below so check them out. Um, but until next time, happy reading and I'll see you all again soon. Bye everyone.